have your Bible tonight, I invite you to open it, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to share with you in just a moment one verse of Scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to do that. You turn in that passage to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in just a moment. We're going to stand and read one verse of Scripture. I wasn't reared in a Christian home, didn't grow up with a godly mother and godly daddy that taught me the things of God and carried me to church and Sunday school and taught me the things of Jesus. Didn't have that privilege growing up. But I want to tell you, God did a work in my life several years ago, and I tell you, I hadn't got over it. Amen. When God does a work in your life, something transpires. Now, uh, it's a lot different if you get saved if you're 8 or 9, and then if you get saved if you're 18 or 19 or 20 or 25 or 40 or 50. But I want to tell you, it doesn't matter where you are. Whenever you get saved, there's a transformation that takes place. And I want to share with you about that tonight. And so let's stand together and let me read this one verse of Scripture. And then we're going to pray And I ask you to pray for me as I share the message tonight. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. And God, we ask you right now in the strong name of Jesus for you to Lord, be the person in command in this place tonight. God, I pray our wills will be submissive to you. I pray our ears will be attuned to you. And God, tonight I pray you'll speak clearly through your messenger tonight. Father, I confess to you my inability to communicate effectively anything of significance. But God, you are able. Father, you are sufficient to reach out and touch the innermost part of every being in this place tonight. God, I pray tonight and I ask you in Jesus' name that not a man or a woman, a boy or girl, uh, uh, not a a, a young person, a a senior adult, not a one of us will leave this place tonight without being touched and stirred by your precious Holy Spirit. Lord, may there be a freshness to the message tonight. May every heart and every life be stirred by your Spirit. And already, God, we covenant one with another that all praise and honor and glory will be to your name and to your name alone. In the name of Jesus, I pray, and just for his sake, amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the verse we just read, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I submit to you tonight, folks, that in reality is true. You know, the Bible doesn't say, therefore, if any man join the church, he's a new creature. Now, I love the church, and I believe in the church, and I frankly uh, uh, don't like anybody knocking the church. But I want to tell you, you can be a part of every church there is in the state of Louisiana and still miss heaven. The Bible doesn't say that being in the church will make you a new creature. Neither does the Bible say, therefore, if any man be baptized, he's a new creature. I believe in baptism. I believe that baptism is a, a picture that, tre- uh, that pictures for us the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and simultaneously pictures the death of the old man in his sinfulness and the resurrection of the new man to walk in newness of life. There's a dual picture in believer's baptism that transpires. However, you can be baptized, as one preacher said, so many times the tadpoles know your social security number, and you'll still miss heaven. I want to tell you, as much as I believe about baptism, as important as it is in a person's life, baptism doesn't save any soul, friend. I I want to tell you, it doesn't save any soul. Neither does the verse say, therefore, if any man turn over a new leaf. Therefore, if any man make good resolves, it doesn't say that. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And I submit to you tonight that in reality, that took place in my life. At a lad, 21 years of age, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, didn't have that godly mother, that godly father uh, to instruct me in the things of God. In fact, uh, When I was just a boy, my dad said to me, son, it's time for you to join the church. 
Now, I didn't know what that meant, except I knew to obey daddy and do what daddy said in a prescribed time and a prescribed place in this particular church. I guess I was about 11, maybe 12 years of age. Uh, me and several other fellows and girls in this church joined the church one Sunday morning. We stood there in the front of the church. The preacher stood there in front of us. He read some questions to us. We read the answers back to him. Whenever they got through, they baptized us by their mode of baptism, sprinkling a little water on top of our heads. And lo and behold, we became a member of that church. All the little group of us are standing there. Didn't anything happen in my heart? I can't tell you about the others that are standing there, but didn't anything happen in my heart? And I strongly suspect that didn't anything happen in their heart either. But I know that nothing happened to me. I had the first profanity I ever heard in my life was inside my own home. First beer I ever saw in my life was inside my own home. I tell you, my life was a turmoil as a young person growing up. And whenever I got to be a young teenager, I thought those things I'd seen my dad and my mom do, that that's the things that I ought to engage in. And I, I began to engage in those things. And I got in a lot of trouble during those days. And I got to be about 13 or 14 years of age, and my interest began to change. I, you know how it does? I mean, those little stringy-head girls you used to couldn't stand take on an entirely different attraction to you. I mean, have you noticed how that happens? It still does that all these years. It was doing that whenever I was 13 or 14 years ago, and that's been a while, and it still happens today. And I, I met this little girl that happened to be a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. I thought she was the cutest thing I'd ever seen, just knew, certainly, this was the one the Lord had in mind for me, even though I did end up marrying a redhead. But I, you know, that little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl, she just captured my heart, I mean, and she happened to be a Baptist. Well, she went to the Baptist church, and guess what? I got interested in the Baptist church, started going to the Baptist church. I really wasn't interested in the Baptist church. I was in that little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. But I started going on account of that little girl, and Man, I got to seeing how they did things around that church. I got to go into Sunday school and the church there in that particular church. And, and lo and behold, man, I got to being real regular. Now, I wasn't too interested in the singing. I wasn't too interested in the preaching. I wasn't too interested in the Sunday school teacher. But I was real interested in that little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. And so as I got to go, I, I got to be real regular there because that little girl, you know, and, and uh, my Sunday school teacher said, I, man, says, I wish everybody's as regular in my class as you are. I was there almost every Sunday. I seldom missed. I wanted to sit by that little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl in church. And, and uh, one Sunday, I thought I'll impress her real good. I'll impress her real good. That preacher got through preaching and he gave that invitation. I sort of observed how they did things around there and I caught on. I wasn't, a, you know, I didn't ride the last turnip truck into town and I, I just knew a little bit about what was happening and, and uh, whenever he gave that invitation, I went forward and took the preacher's hand and said, I want to join this church. He said, you believe in God? I said, I sure do. He set me down over here on the front bench. Lady came with a card in her hand, got my name, my address, my phone number, all that. And, and after uh, they'd quit singing, he stood me up there and said I'd come to join this church, I, uh, that I believed in God and that, and that I, I, I wanted to be a part of that, that fellowship. Well, uh, people came by and they shake, shook my hand. And the next week in the mail, I got a letter and it said, you need to be baptized. Well, I got that letter in the mail, and I thought, well, I already done that one time. I don't guess it'll hurt to do it again. So I did what that letter said. I showed up at that place. They told me to show up in that church, and I got there. In that church, they handed me some garments. They said, you go in this room, take off your clothes, put on these clothes. And I went in there, took all my clothes, put on those clothes. They brought me out of that room down a little hallway. And I imagine behind those curtains there, there's a window. Is there right there? And there's a, there's a baptistry back there, isn't it? And some steps that go down into it. Yeah. Well, that's the way it was in that church. They carried me out down a little hallway up those steps. And I looked and standing there in that pool of water was that preacher. Water all the way up to here. I walked down those steps, stood beside him. He put me underneath that water, raised me up. I was wet from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Wasn't a dry thread on my back, but nothing had happened in here. Nothing. And you say, preacher, wait a minute. That preacher asked you if you believed in God. Well, folks, I'm from Mississippi. Everybody in Mississippi believes in God. <laughs> Hello? I mean, everybody in Mississippi believes in God and got a Bible. They don't serve him and don't read it, but they all believe it, you know. 
I won't say I'm just teasing there, but I listen, I knew about God. I knew that God was. Never has been a time in my life that I didn't believe there was a God. But I want to tell you to believe that God is is not to be saved. Amen is not to be saved. In fact, the book of James tells us, listen to this verse. Uh, you might want to make a note of it and turn to it, but in James chapter 2, verse 17, listen to what the Bible says. Excuse me, verse 19. Thou believest there is one God. Listen to this. Thou believest there is one God. Thou doest well. Now listen to this. You've caught up with the devil. The devils also believe and tremble. To just believe that God is, friends, just makes you equal with the devil. I mean, the devil believes that God is, but he never has repented and turned himself to God. And just believing there's a God doesn't get anybody to heaven, doesn't get anybody saved. But I did have a God as I was growing up. I, my God was, was athletics. You know, if you could kick it or throw it or hit it or whatever, I mean, I was crazy about it. I mean, that's just all my life. And I had a little extra talent in, in playing football, and, and that's what my life was almost. I mean, that was totally the commitment of my life was to sports and athletics. Whenever I finished high school, I had the opportunity to go off to college and got a scholarship to go off to college and play football. And when I got off to college playing football, the idea whenever I, I came along, and that's been a while ago, young folks, but listen. Listen to me. The idea when I came along was the idea that, that the more ungodly and unscrupulous and the more of a reprobate you are, then the, the better athlete you will be. I'm thankful to God today for an organization that calls itself the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I'm thankful to God for chapters, whole chapters. Y'all got a whole chapter in your school here, have you? Have you got one in your school here? A whole chapter with FCA? Do any of you young people know? How about it? Some of you young people back in. Y'all have a whole chapter? In your school, you don't have one. Y'all need to get a FCA chapter in this local school around here. Amen. Get it, get it in there where these fo young folks can be engaged in it because they tell our young people the truth today that, friend, you can get out there and compete with the best of them and still serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But whenever I got off in college, that idea wasn't in my mind. It wasn't difficult for me because I didn't have any foundation to begin to go the way of the world and to take on the attributes of the world. My life was just in shambles as far as the morality and spirituality of it. And after two years in junior college in football, I had the thought of where I was going to school for two more years, and I had opportunities to go to several places whenever my coach came. And he said, Step, he said, I'm going to be leaving this school and going down to a school in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and, and going to be the head coach. You're my quarterback. You already know my offense. And I want you to go down there and be my, my quarterback down at this school in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Well, I knew what was in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I knew the University of Southern Mississippi was down there, but I didn't know anything else. And I said, well, they, I knew they already had a coach down there, and I knew he wasn't going there. I said, where are you going, coach? He said, well, I'm going to a Baptist school down in Hattiesburg, and that Baptist school will have a get good influence on you, and you need to go down there. It'll, it'll be beneficial to you. And I said, well, what's the name of it, coach? He said, well, it's a Baptist school. I said, you already said that, coach. I said, what's the name of the school? down there and had his brain. He said, well, the name of it is Mississippi Woman's College, but they're changing the name of it. It's going to be, it, they're making a co-educational school out of what's been an all-girls school, and they're going to sell the concept of that with a full-fledged athletic program, and we'll be the first football team in the history of that school. I said, coach. I'm not going to any girls' school. I can see the headlines on the sports page. The girls from woman's college lose again. I said, I'm not going to any girls' school to play ball. But to make a long story short, he got four or five or six of the guys on the team there to commit to go. And they talked to me in August of 1954. I wound up on what was then the campus of William Carey College in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We started out for football, much like you do in August, two a day out there. I mean, sweating and beating each other halfway to death and trying to put together a ball team. We got out there on that, got, got out there with those guys. Most of those guys on that, that field out there were just like me, just pagan, didn't have any concept of who God was or where God was or what God's plan was for their lives. But whenever school took in, right about the 1st of September, and those students began to come on that campus, the students from all over uh, the south, the southwest, the southeast, and, uh, and there in the southern part of that state, they began to assemble there. I noticed there was a difference among those students on that campus. 
I mean, they'd sit around the piano and sing and play songs like Every Day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Now, uh, the thing that was strange to me about that, I'd heard those songs, but I heard them on Sunday, and they'd sing them on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. You know, I, I thought, where in the world is going on here? I mean, you'd see them at mealtime. They'd all be praying. I mean, you'd even pass some of their rooms, and they'd be praying and asking God to send revival on that campus. I mean, there was a different breed of young folks that I'd come in contact with on that campus. And then about the time we got started, when school took in at the 1st of September, about three or four days or a week after we'd been in school, a new dean of men arrived on the campus. This dean of men's name was Andy Tate. Andy Tate was one of the most holy, godly men I've ever seen in all my life. Square jaw, gray hair swept back, smile on his face. I never saw him that he wasn't just uh, in a dignified manner. In fact, if I were to picture Moses stepping out of the Old Testament in our contemporary life, I'd picture him looking just like old Andy Tate. He was one of the most holy, most godly men I ever met in my life. And for some reason or other, he sort of took to me. See, he sort of took a liking to me. I felt like I was polluting him. I, I felt like I was corrupting him. You know, I'd try to avoid him, not because I didn't appreciate him. I admired him. I, I was really fine. I, I couldn't see what he saw in me, but I felt like I was getting him dirty when I'd get around him. He was so holy and so godly. He'd come out and watch us play football and practice out there in the afternoon. We'd be out there practicing, get through practicing, coach would gather us around in a huddle, and he'd say a few things he wanted to say before we went to the dress room, and then he or somebody there, he'd lead us in a word of prayer. And then we'd start off to the dressing room, and I, I'd take off to the dressing room, and I'd feel something grab my arm, and I'd turn around and look, and there's old Andy Tate. That gray hair swept back, that Smile on his face. He said, hey, Step, said, how do you think we're going to come out Saturday at the ball game? Oh, Dr. Tate, I, I don't know. I hope we're going to win. He, you run that option Saturday like you was running out in practice today. He says, we're going we're gonna to win. We're going to pin their ears back there. And, man, I, I just was trying to get away because I, I just knew I was just corrupting that old guy. You know, I just I was just polluting him. And so I'd go into the dressing room, and the next day we'd be out there practicing, you know, and everything. We'd get in that little huddle over there and, and start to take off and, Somebody grabbed me again. I turned around on Andy Tate. said, think we're going to win that ball game Saturday? Step, they boy said, if you throw in that pass uh, like you're throwing that day, we're going to win on Saturday. Well, you know, I didn't know what that guy was doing. I didn't know what he was doing. But that guy was demonstrating some affection. But I was feeling like I was polluting him. I looked out of the corner of my eye one day, and I saw him standing over there. Got around when we had that little huddle on the other side of that huddle. When the pre, when when the coach got through with his prayer, man, I took off to the dressing room. He didn't get me. I got in, got showered, got cleaned up. Coming out of the dressing room, standing at the dressing room door was old Andy Tate. He says, "Hey, step," said I. Just thought I'd, I just thought I'd eat supper with you tonight if you don't mind. And I said, "No, Dr. Tate, I, I don't mind." And we went upstairs and sat down and ate supper. And he. He didn't tell me how sorry and low down and wretched and ungodly I was. He didn't tell me what a, uh, a sinner and how, how much I deserved. Hell, he didn't tell me that he could have shipped me because I was breaking this rule or that rule or that. He, he, just said, he just sat down over there and he never even verbalized it. He never even said, I care about you. You're important to me. But I sat there and talked to that old fellow as I ate my supper that night and and I tell you, I just began to wonder what made him tick. I, I, I'd sort of been a disappointment by this time to my mom and dad. They disappointed the kind of guy I'd turned out to be. They weren't proud of me at all, I guarantee you. I, I'd gone even contrary to what they would consider uh, the right way, and they, they weren't pleased at all about me. And I, I didn't really know that anybody cared anything about me at that time, and frankly, didn't really care a whole lot of whether they did or not. But, but when this old guy just, just began to to look at me and take an interest in me. I, it, it became burdensome to me. What is it? That, what, what's that guy What's that guy trying to do? What's he up to? What's his, what's his motivation here as far as it? And I'd lay down on my bed and I'd look up to the ceiling and I'd, I'd just ask myself, what is it about that guy? What makes that old guy tick? Well, I tell you, several weeks in school there and incident after incident began taking place and students praying 
I tell you, they's praying for revival. They, they, you know how you used to pray for revival? They's praying for revival there, Brother Scott. And they, you'd pass by the room of students, some of them ministerial students, some of them mission volunteers, some of them just godly young people off at college day, and they'd be down on their knees. Lord, send revival or burn down this dormitory. Now, if you're not used to something like that, that'll get your attention. Amen? I want to tell you, I, it's pretty hard to sleep with one eye open. Amen? <laughs> You think that you think that thing's gonna come down any minute? There, you know they they praying for revival. They asking God to send this spirit. They asking them football players to get saved or send them home because they hadn't been used to anything like that. I mean, you you have an all girls school and you bring in an army of guys in that school. Most of them hard headed, knuckle headed football players there. You know, on that school. I mean, you create a different atmosphere on that place. And they were praying for God to do something. I thought, man, what if this plane catches on fire and I'm asleep here in this bed, you know? And I, I mean, I didn't understand what was going on there. And one night, one night after this all gone, I mean, it was in October by now. School had, had taken place. I mean, you go into chapel. Every time you went to chapel, there was a preacher that, that stood up and preached. I thought I'd wound up in a monastery somewhere. I thought, what in the world am I doing in a place like this? Well, one one night I was out in a place I shouldn't have been, and and it just seemed like God just just brought me back to the campus there that night. We always kept a a side door open there for the students, the athletes to come in and and get in even after curfew, even after lights out and whatnot. We'd keep that door open, and so I came in, parked the old jalopy of a car I'd borrowed from a friend of mine, and and came up to the side door to open that door, and the door was locked. And I kicked the door and probably swore with an oath or something, but about that time after I kicked it, the door opened. There stood my roommate, Reuben Quidley, and he was standing there. And he said, I thought you was going somewhere. And I said, well, I just decided to come in. He said, I had the door. I don't know how it got locked. It must have just got locked. So I pulled the door to it, walked down the hallway a couple of doors down to my room down there. And he said, Step. He said, some guys are in this room. And as he's saying this, some guys in this room, he pulled me by the arm inside the door of this room, and they're having a prayer meeting. And pull them in there, and I'm in a prayer meeting in a room with some guys. And there are guys around the bed there on their knees praying. And I see some of these football players around on their knees. And I see over here at the end of the bed, the old Andy Tate, that gray hair swept back, that square jaw, that smile on his face. And I walked in. He looked up and acknowledged I was, I'd walked in. I walked in. They shut the door. And they got in. And they, they started or continued. I think they continued because I think I interrupted them. And, and and this one prayed, and that one prayed. You've been in over with this one, and then this one, and then you've been in over where it come around, and it came around, and it's my time, my time to pray. And I, I'd been in that Sunday school I was telling you about on account of that little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl, and I'd, I'd learned how to mouth a few words, and so I just, I just uttered some words there that I had learned in Sunday school and remembered, and whenever I got through, somebody else, some else prayed, and then somebody else, and then old Andy Tate prayed, and and then whenever he finished, we sat around and talked, and he looked at his wife, and he said, hey, guys, said it's about, he said, it's about time for lights out here. He said, we better get to our rooms here and, and, and call it a night. And so this one went to their room, this and their room. I, my roommate and I walked next door to our room, sat down on the bed. I took off the shoe, slammed it against the wall. He said, what's the matter with you, Step? I said, I'll tell you what's the matter with me. I'm getting out of this place. I should have never come here in the first place. I don't know why I came. He had opportunity to go other places to play ball. I don't know why I took the opportunity to come here to this place, but I'm leaving in the morning. I'm packing up. He said, Steph, you're crazy, man. He says, you're going to let the team down. He says, you're going to let the coach down. He says, you're going to lose a year of eligibility. You're stupid, man. He says, you need to, to, to do whatever it is. Why don't you go talk, talk to Dr. Tate? Dr. Tate can help you. I said, man, I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm going I'm to get up in the morning, pack my duds, and get out of here. I took a shoe off, slammed it against the wall, throw myself up in the bed, and we just lay there talking. Cut the lights out, 11 o'clock, 11.30, 12 o'clock, 12.30. A little after 12.30, between 12.30 and a quarter to one, we still talking. He said, Step, says, man, listen, says, you're making a mistake. He says, why don't you go down there and see Dr. Tate? I said, you think, he, you think he's still up? He said, I don't know. Why don't you go down and knock on his door? And I stepped out of my room, down the hallway, Dana Men's office, just a few doors down, and I knocked on the door with lightning. I just knocked on that door a couple of times. It seemed like by the time I knocked on that door, that door opened, and there stood that old gray-haired man, that square jaw that smiled on his face, and he looked at me, and he says, Step, he says, come on in. He says, I've been waiting on you. I didn't know this until a few years after that. 
Old Andy Tate left that prayer meeting, walked across the street of that campus and upstairs to some duplex apartments across the street where some preacher boys and, and another football player by the name of Billy Mitchell were down on their knees praying for old Step Martin to get saved praying for old Step Martin to come to God. And they got on their knees. And about midnight, old Stormy Bowell, who was one of the preachers in that group, about midnight, he said, Dr. Tate, we ain't got to, haven't got to pray anymore. We don't have to pray anymore. said, God's going to save old Step Martin. And old Andy Tate had got up off his knees and had come back over on the campus and come back in his office there in his, his suite, his apartment there on that floor just a few minutes before I knocked on that door. And he said, come on in, Step. I went in and I told Andy Tate much of what I told you here tonight. And I said, Dr. Tate's any hope for anybody like me. And Brother Scott quoted it as he opened his Bible and read, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I said, Dr. Tate, you don't understand, man. I said, no way God could love me. The way I've taken his name in vain, the way I've lived, the kind of life I've conducted myself, I... Now, no way. My mom and dad don't even love me. No way God could love me. I, and he read it again. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I said, Dr. Tate, I said, I said, there's just no way. I couldn't fathom that God could love anybody as sinful as me. I said, Dr. Tate, I've tried to be different. Listen, I've tried to be. You know, I, I never did... I never did say I, one day I want to grow up to be a bum. I want to grow up to be a tramp athlete. I didn't sit down on a street corner somewhere and say, that's my goal in life. A friend, without God, the devil will make mincemeat out of you. Do you know that? Without God, the devil will destroy you. He'll warp your life. He'll thrust your soul into a devil's hell. And I want to tell you, friend, you can go to hell as quick from the pew of a Baptist church as you can from a bar room. Are you listening to me? You can go just as quick. You can go just as quick. I sat there and old Andy Tate's off and I said, Dr. Tate, I, I never want to be like I am. I've tried to be different. I, I never want to be the kind of person. I remember as a teenage boy, I, I came in one night and walked down the hallway by my mom and dad's room. I heard my mom in there sobbing, in there sobbing. I thought she's sick and I tapped on the door lightly. She said, come in. I opened the door and I said, Mom, what's the matter? And she screamed, what's the matter? What's the matter? Says, you're putting me in my grave. That's what's the matter. You won't mind. You won't come home. You won't do right. What's the matter? You're killing me. That's what's the matter. Man, I backed out of that door and pulled that door to and walked back down that hall and out the front door in a whole job of a car I'd bought and worked to buy whenever I my 11th or 12th grade in school. And I drove around Jackson, Mississippi until I found a Walgreens drugstore open and I went in and I had just a few dollars, a couple of dollars or so and I laid it down. I said to the lady there, I said, own a box of candy and I and she gave me a box of candy that that money to buy. And I went back home and rolled in that driveway and went down that same hallway to my mother's room, knocked on that door and I walked in. And I said, Mama, I love you and I'm gonna be good and I'm not gonna hurt you anymore and I'm gonna be like you want me to be. And here, Mama, forgive me and Mama hugged me and I went to my room and for about a week or a week and a half, I dotted every I, I crossed every T, I kept all the rules, but then right back and right. You see, you can't make of yourself only what God can make of you. Are you listening to me? You can't transform yourself, friend. That takes the grace of God. I said, Dr. Tate, I've tried to be different. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about that. I, I've tried to, you're telling me that, that God loves me and you're telling me that he can make me different. Doctor, I've tried to be different. And he read it again. He says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he said, Step, if you'll get down here on your knees tonight, and if you'll ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and into your life and forgive your sin and save your soul tonight, Jesus will come into your heart and life. And he'll forgive your sin, and he'll transform you by the grace of God. Well, I'd watched that old man. I'd watched his life. I'd watched his walk with God. And I said to him, as I looked at him, I said, Dr. Tate, are you telling me that if I get down here tonight and I'll ask Jesus in my heart that he'll cleanse me, he'll forgive all my sin, and he'll enable me to be the person that he wants me to be. He took his Bible and he closed it and laid it down on a little table there in front of him. He said, Step, if you get down here tonight and ask Jesus to come into your heart, ask him to forgive your sin, save all your soul. He doesn't come in. He doesn't forgive your sin. He doesn't say, he says, I'll lay that book down. He said, I'll never teach it. I'll never preach it again. 
I slipped off that couch boy, Andy Tate, October the 24th, 1954, William Carey College, John in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I said, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to be the kind of person that I am. Lord God, come into my life. Take control of my life. Lord, make me the person that you want me to be. There wasn't any bolt of lightning. There wasn't any clap of thunder. That building didn't shake, not one bit. When I got up off that my knees and I looked at old Andy Tate, I said, Dr. Tate, I really meant that. I really meant that. I want God to change me. And old Andy Tate said, read it again. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he handed me a little Gideon Testament. He said, I want you to read the Gospel of John. I want you to read through it. I read myself to sleep that night in my bed. Got up the next morning, went to breakfast. I showed everybody in the child hall, John 3, 16, amen. I said, have you ever seen that? Hey, have you ever seen it? They looked at me like a calf looks at a new gate. They didn't know, they didn't know what in the world, what has happened to that guy. They couldn't believe what transpired. I mean, revival broke out on that campus. It saw 22 out of them ball players get saved. I mean, God was saving them right and left, right there. One old boy on our team, uh, revival broke out. We started having chapel. And old Andy Tate came to me and he said, Steph, I want you to, I want you to get up in chapel. He said, I want you to testify. I said, what's that? And he said, that's you getting up in chapel and telling the folks what the Lord's done for you. I said, I can't do that, Dr. Tate. He said, what you mean? He says, you really meant it when you asked Jesus in your heart, didn't you? I said, yeah, I really meant it. But I can't stand up in front of people and say anything. Now, I can get out there and throw that pig skin. I can get out there and tackle and run, block and do that. But I can't get up and say anything. He said, oh, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. He said, I, he said, the Bible says you can. I said, where is it? He said, open it to Philippians. And I couldn't find it. He showed me where Philippians was. He said, look at the fourth chapter. I looked at the fourth chapter. He said, look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strength me. I said, what does that mean? He said, that means you can do it. I said, well, I'll do it then. Amen. If that's what it means, I'll do it. I'll take it at his word. And so I, I got all my buddies to come to that chapel. And one of my buddies was named Don Swallow. Don was from Louisiana. Don from down at Via Plata, Louisiana. Lived down there and uh, uh, was in school there and, 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 uh, and, and uh, Hines with me and he'd come down to William Carey down there with us. We'd been buddies and friends for a long time and we went together and went places together uh, for a long time and after I got saved and I'm going to give my testimony. I said, Don, I said, I want you to come to chapel in the morning. So I'm going to give my testimony in there and tell about what the Lord done for me. And Don gave me this excuse. He said, I can't come. I'm a Catholic. I said, well, Don, what's that got to do with it? See, I just got saved five days ago, four, five, six days ago. I didn't know anything about that. I hadn't had any soul winning. Uh, I hadn't had any, any tax training. I hadn't had anything like that. I said, what's that got to do with it, Don? You lost and going to hell, man. You know that. You know, I, I mean, I'm going to hell. I knew he's going to hell. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go to hell from. Amen? I won't tell you. And, 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 and I said, you, you know you, you need to get right with God. And I said, I said, I want you to come. He said, he wouldn't promise. He said, I can't. I don't know. I said, I, and, and, but when I got up to give my testimony, I looked and coming through the back door of the church, old Don Swallow, uh, of the chapel was old Don Swallow, and he sat out on the very back row against the wall back there, white T-shirt, blue dungarees on, shoes with no socks on. That was the mod of that day. You know what I mean? I mean, he, he was in, and so he, he, he sat down back there, and I got up and gave my testimony, and old Andy Tate got up and gave an invitation, and whenever he gave that invitation, I looked back. And coming down that old hall, them big old arms of that big old tackle, I was always glad he's on my side. I guarantee he, he was a big old huge guy. Coming down, those arms were swinging by his side. As he walked down, he got down there at the front, fell on his knees, put his arms around old Andy Tate and pointed up there and said, whatever did that for old step, I want you to tell me about it. Amen. <laughs> old Don Swallow got saved. Amen. The grace of God moved in his life. And listen to me. Listen to me. God. God saved him, and he became a lay preacher, a lay preacher. First church ever pastored, old Don, came out on layman's day and spoke for me at the first church I ever pastored. He died and went to heaven from DeRitter, Louisiana, where he was the head football coach down there for many, many years. But he came out there at the first church I ever pastored to speak for me on layman's day, and he got up, God bear me witness, got up on Layman's Day and said to my people, I want you to open your Bible to the book of Ezekiel. I said, Ezekiel. 
Easy kill. Easy kill. I said, that's Ezekiel, Don. Ezekiel. He said, yeah, that's what it is. Now, this God, he couldn't pronounce it, but I wish you'd have heard the message. But I want to tell you, he knew what God had to say because God had done a work in his life. I mean, God saved 22 out of those football. Didn't, we was over in Texas playing football over there and playing against the team at the halftime. They had us 14 to nothing, but it's worse than that. We hadn't even made a first down. Boy, they was beating us good. And we got in the halftime, and the coach was giving us this pep talk at halftime. And, and he said, we're going to go out and do this, and, and we're going to go out and do that, and we're going to do it. I'm thinking, if we got real smart, we'd get on the bus and get out of here while we're still alive, you know. But, but he's telling us we're going to do all this, and so we go out the second half, and lo and behold, they kick off to us, and we make the first first down we made uh, of the game, and then we make a second first down, and then we make a third first down, and then it gets to be third down and seven yards to go. Well, you know now, you know anything about football, I mean, you've got to either make it or you're going to have to kick the ball away, the first offensive spurt we've had all night. And, and lo and behold, I didn't know what to do, and so I called timeout. Now, football's changed a little bit since uh, I played ball. My, I have six kids, three sons, smart Alex said, Daddy, when you played, did y'all fold your helmets up and put them in your pocket? <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, I, you know, you know how they can be at times, you know, they just, no, no, <laughs> no, we had, we had, we had plastic helmets, but you couldn't go over and talk to the coach. You couldn't. You'd try to look over there and get some kind of sign from him, and in situations like that, he didn't know what to do. He's looking the other way, you know. <laughs> That's what he's done. And so we's all kneeling around here, and I'm trying, I'm saying, guys, we got to have a first down. We got to have a first down. I said to man, can you get behind that, that halfback and let me hit you with a down and out? He said, I don't know, Step. He's been on me like flypaper all night. I said to my, I said to my tackle, old Don, I said, Don, can you block that guy? I said, we've got to have seven yards and a first down. He said, I don't know, Step. said, he's tough. And man, I didn't know what in the world to do. The meanest guy I've ever met in my life was on our ball team. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? The meanest guy I'd ever met in my life was on our ball team. I've never met anybody as profane and ungodly in my life as this guy before I saved. I've never met anybody as, as wretched as that one. In fact, I've never met anybody as wretched and ungodly and reprobate since I've been saved as that guy. Amen? That's the worst guy I'd ever, I'd witnessed to him. I'd done everything. We'd try to get him saved, trying to get him to turn his life over to the Lord. But he was the most profane, ungodly guy. In fact, I, I was oftentimes frightened to be around him because if I'd have been God, I'd have zapped him. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, he was that bad. Now, I'm telling you, he was that bad. And so here I am, I'm trying to figure out, and this guy was a sinner on our team. Every time I took a snap, I just touched that dude. <laughs> Every time, that's right. That's right. And there we are, we try and talk. We can't, can we do that? Can we do the other? Can we do that? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it dawned on me. And I just, I just said to myself, Lord, I don't know whether you're interested in ball games or not. <laughs> but if you'll just tell me what to do, I'm saying this to myself, Lord, I just give all the glory to you. And that guy was right there, and I'm like that, and he said, What you doing? I said, I was just asking God what play to call. And he swore with an oath. He swore with an oath right there. We got our huddle. The referee blowed the whistle. We got our huddle together. I called the play. We ran a Georgia Tech belly series. That don't mean anything to you, but I'd get the ball from the center. Fake to the fullback as he would dive, ride with the halfback as he'd come up out here, get out here to the end. If the end took me, I'd pitch. If it took the pitch man, I'd cut up with an option designed like all offensive plays to go for a touchdown. All defensive plays designed to stop you from going for a touchdown. That's what the game is, football. But I got that ball. I got out there, rode with that halfback, got out there to that end. That end took the pitch, man, I cut up, made 14 yards in the first down, got back to the huddle, and that old center grabbed me by the shoulder pad and said, Ask him again, Steph. Ask him again. <laughs> Ask him again. 
Amen. I wish I could tell you, I wish I could tell you that old boy got saved, but as far as I know and have heard, and I inquire often whenever I meet some folks who hadn't gone on from this life, have they heard if old Walt, that old Walt, had Walt, had Walt got saved? I tell you, God blessed my life. God turned my life around. I wish I had time to tell you about his calling me to preach. Wish I had time to tell you about the little wife he gave to me. Wish I had time to tell you about the, the six precious children, the 12 grandchildren that God blessed. Wish I had time to go on that. Just let me tell you there. After I got saved, my precious mom and dad, very dear to my heart, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do about about telling them what happened. And finally, I got sort of a green light to go home, and I did. I went home, carried a preacher boy with me to my house, and planned to get there so when my dad came in, I could share with him what happened to me. And sure enough, on Saturday evening, he came in late working, and he always had this thing. He'd be pulling a rolled-up newspaper from his hip pocket when he'd come through the back door. I could see it like it was right here tonight. Going over to old Cane Bottom Rocker and. uh in a little makeshift den of our house, and he'd unroll that newspaper and sit down in that rocker and sort of unwind before he'd ever eat supper. That's just his thing. He did that every single night that I can remember. He'd come in. That night he came in, pulled that newspaper out. I hadn't been home 16-plus months. Hadn't been home. He saw me sitting there on the couch. said, hi, son. Walked over there, unrolled that newspaper, started reading it, rocking in that rocking chair. Man, I sat there. I didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say, didn't know how to start, how to begin. I just knew God wanted me to go home, talk to my mom and dad. I believe he wanted me to talk to my dad first because I believe he had a little more rapport with me than I did with my mom. And I I said, Daddy, I just come home and tell you, Mom, I'm not like I used to be. I done, I done got saved, and I'm, I'm a different person now. My dad didn't even comment. I don't think he knew how to comment to what I said. I don't think he knew what kind of response. And I said, I said, Daddy, Dr. Tate told me it don't matter how bad anybody's been, if you'll ask Jesus to come in your heart, if you'll ask him to forgive your sin and save your soul, it doesn't matter how bad you've been. I'd seen my daddy take those, take those galloping dominoes and throw them against the wall and ask for a seven. I'd seen him draw for that flush or that inside straight. I'd seen him play that poker. I'd heard him utter that profanity. I'd seen him drink that booze. I'd seen all those things. I said, Daddy, don't matter how bad you've been, no matter what you've done, if you ask Jesus to come, Dr. Tate said he'd forgive your sin and save your soul. My dad didn't even come in, sitting there in that rocking chair, rocking back and forth, that paper in his hand. Finally, I sat there, I don't know how long it was, but I sat there, it seemed like a long time. I reached my pocket, pulled out that little Gideon Testament, opened up John 3, 16, walked, walked over, got on my knees beside that old rocker, and I read, Daddy, listen to this, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Daddy, I wonder tonight, would you just ask Jesus to come in your heart? I asked him to come into my heart, and he made me a new person. And Daddy, he'll forgive your sin. He'll save your soul. My daddy got home around 8 o'clock, after 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, somewhere between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, that old squeaking rocker stopped squeaking. And my old daddy tumbled out of that old rocking chair on his knees and wet the tile floor of that den, and he prayed out and asked God, God, save me like you did my boy. God, save me like you did my boy. My daddy got saved. My mama came in while we were talking and sat down on a little ottoman there, and whenever I got through talking to daddy and praying, I turned to her and I said, Mama, will you give your heart to the Lord? And she just began to cry and say, Oh, my God. Oh, my God, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? I said, Mother, what, what do you mean? I said, she said, when I was a little girl right at the old home place, I made a decision for Christ. But what have I done? What have I done? I didn't even know what my mom was talking about. I had no idea. She even knew what I was talking about. And, I, you know, when I went home, God knew where I was going. And a young preacher boy named Harry Howard went home with me. And I looked over at Harry. And Harry said, let me talk to your mom, step. And he got over there, and he opened his Bible to First John. He knew about First John. I didn't even know about First John then, preacher. Amen. And he read to her, if we confess our sins. My mother recommitted her life to God and got things right with God. Friend, I want to tell you, we hugged and we shouted. We praised God and rejoiced. I, about seven, eight years after that, uh, that my daddy said, uh, I told him, you need to get baptized now. You need, need to get baptized. He says, well, says, uh, 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that, says, but uh, uh don't you don't you be trying to make a Baptist out of me. I said, Look, you don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven, but you gotta have Jesus in your heart. You gotta have Jesus in your heart. And uh I got a letter from him about oh, I don't know, about three or four years after that, and he said, he, he's getting baptized in this Baptist church up here. I want to know if I can come baptize him. I said, I said, no, sir. I said, I, I can't do that. I want that pastor to baptize. I want there to be a bond between you and him that'll, that'll just attach you to that fellowship. And, and about three or four, five years after that, I got a letter from him. He said, son, they want me to be a deacon up here in this church. Can you come up here to my ordination service? And I said, oh, I wouldn't miss it. Oh, friend, listen, I came up to that ordination service. My dad was kneeling there at the front of that altar when they ordained him. I laid my hands on his head. I looked up in the belfry of that big church there in Jackson, Mississippi, Daniel Memorial Baptist Church. And I said, thank you, Lord. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I want to tell you tonight, friend, church won't do that for you. I want to tell you tonight, religion won't do that for you. I want to tell you tonight, only Jesus can do that for you. The poet said it best, I think, when he took in his hand a, an old violin and, and held it up, and he, he, he testified concerning it in this fashion. It was battered and scarred in the auctioneer. Thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on an old violin. And he held it up with a smile. What are my bid, good folks, said he, who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two, only two, two dollars, and who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, and going for three, but no, from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from off the strings, he played a melody, pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sang. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow, a thousand dollars, and who will make it two? Two thousand, and who will make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and worn with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, just like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once. He's going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes. But the master comes. And the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Now listen, Jesus can touch you tonight. And Jesus can change you tonight, and Jesus can make you a new creature tonight if you'll open that heart and that life to him. You'll never get to heaven by being baptized. You'll never get to heaven by joining a church. You'll never, never get to heaven by being a good, clean, moral person. That, if you could get to heaven by any of those ways, there wouldn't have been a cross outside the walled city of Jerusalem on a hill called Calvary. The only way you can get to heaven is to come to Jesus, to come to Jesus and confess to him that you're nothing more than a wretched, hell-deserving sinner and invite him into your heart and into your life. And if you've never done that, in Jesus' name tonight, in Jesus' name tonight, I beg you, I plead with you tonight, open your heart and invite him to come in. Would you bow your heads with me just now? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every Christian in earnest prayer just now. God is tugging at hearts and lives in this place tonight. I want to ask you tonight, be honest with yourself and be honest with God right now. Just before I pray, just before I pray, if you're here tonight and you can say, Brother Steph, I know that I know that I know tonight that Jesus lives in my heart. I know if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. I'd spend eternity with him. I have him in my heart and in my life. I know I'm saved. Would you just as a thanksgiving testimony slip your hand up right now to say, I know that preacher. I, I know I'm saved. I know if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. Would you do that anywhere, everywhere? Just slip it up. Nobody's going to embarrass you, single you out, come to you. Just slip it up. All right, God bless you. Put it down. If you'd say to me tonight, Brother Step, I couldn't, 
I couldn't lift my hand. I couldn't say I know that. But I want to know that. I'd give anything if I could know that I know that I know. That if I died tonight, heaven would be my home. I want that with all my heart. I want my sins forgiven. I want Jesus to run and rule my life. I want him to make me the person that he would have me to be. I want him to live in my heart so that one day I'll know I'll live with him in heaven. I wish you'd pray for me tonight. I couldn't lift my hand and say that I know that heaven's my home. I know if I died, I'd go to, I'd go to heaven tonight. I couldn't lift my hand. Say, but I want that in my heart. I want my sins forgiven. I want to be saved. I want Jesus in my heart. Would you pray for me tonight, brother? Say, would you allow me to pray for you? Trust me. I'll not embarrass you, single you out. I'll not come to you. That's not my, I want to help you. If I can't help you, I won't know it and it hurt you. I'll assure you of that. Will you just slip that hand? Let me see it right now. I want to pray for you. Just ease it up. God bless you and God bless you. Thank you. You may put them down. Is there another? Lift them up right now. I want to pray for you tonight. I want God. I want you to know God like I know God tonight. I want you to have God's forgiveness in your heart like I. Hey, listen, he'll blot out every transgression. He'll break down every barrier. He'll wash you and you'll become whiter than snow. If you'll open that heart, is there another that just slipped that hand up? Would you do it? And let me let me, let me see it. I I want to want to see it. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you personally. I'm not going to come to you, but I want to pray for you. I want to do it right here tonight. Is there another anywhere in this congregation tonight? Just slip it up, young man, young lady, student, boy, girl, boy, girl. And how about you tonight? Do you know? If you don't know, if you couldn't lift that hand to say I know. Would you allow me to pray for you right now? Would you do it? Just stick it up and let me see it. Let me see it. All right. Our heads are bowed. Father, right now, you know these hearts, every one of our hearts here tonight. God, I believe you're dealing with the hearts and lives of individuals in a special way. And I especially, Lord, want to lift up these who said, Brother Steph, pray for me tonight. Oh, Lord Jesus. God, I'm so thankful that you love us you love us while we're yet sinners. Lord, you love us in the, in the muck and mire of our sin. And God, you want to relieve us. You want to lift us. God, you want to forgive us. You want to cleanse us and change us by your power and by your mind. And God, I pray for these dear ones tonight who lifted their hand and said, Preacher, pray for me. I need God. I need God in my life. Lord, be the enabler in these hearts tonight. Enable these to, Lord, come tonight and invite you to come in. You said you stand at the door and knock. And you said if any man, God, rich man or poor man, big man or little man, Lord, uh, uh, a man of, of means or a man of poverty, Lord, it doesn't matter who it is. You said if any man, if any man, if any man will open the door, you said you would come in. And Lord, I pray tonight that these dear, dear ones would tonight open the door of their heart and invite Jesus to come in. Lord, I pray they would do that and that they would declare that openly and unashamedly tonight in a special way. In Jesus' name, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Listen, tonight, if you lifted your hand or whether you lifted your hand or not and you really want Jesus in your heart, I want to ask you to do something tonight. I want to ask you to do something right now tonight. If you lifted your hand, I want you to do this right there, right where you are, right there. And if you didn't lift your hand, but you still, you still want Jesus, know you need Jesus in your heart, I want you to do something and really mean it in your heart. I want you to pray a prayer with me tonight. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I want to qualify this. I want you to hear me. It won't do you any good to pray a prayer with me if you don't mean it in your heart. But if you mean it in your heart, God will hear you tonight and he'll answer that prayer if you mean it in your heart. And so if you mean it in your heart, right there where you are, right there in your seat, maybe you, especially you who lifted your hand, but maybe even if you did not lift your hand, but you know you need Jesus, pray this prayer with me and really mean it in your heart. Just pray it. Right there in your heart. You can pray it silently, privately, between you and God, but really mean it right now. Dear God, just pray it in your heart. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. 
I'm sorry for my sin tonight. And I don't want to spend eternity in a devil's hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for me in my place as my substitute. Lord Jesus, tonight I invite you to come into my heart and forgive all my sin and take control of my life tonight, right here, right now, and make me the person that you want me to be. Lord Jesus, I want you to do this for me tonight. I mean it with all my heart. I trust you as my Savior and as my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.